Hi everyone, welcome to AI Crack channel. This is Akash Gangwar and today we'll be studying definite integrals lecture one. In this lecture, we'll be talking about basics of definite integrals and few properties. Okay. So let's begin a lecture with the understanding definite integrals with area. In case of indefinite integrals, what we primarily did was reverse of differentiation, right? But in this case, we have to understand definite integrals with the help of area. So let's say we have a curve like this. This function is fx. Okay. This point is a, this point is b. Okay. And since the function is fx, this point would be f of a and this point would be f of b. Right. Now let's say we have to estimate this area. And this is not a standard shape because this is curved over here, right? It's not a straight line. It's a curve. So that's why it's not a standard shape. So we have to estimate the area. So the best possible way is to try to find out this area with the help of rectangle. But in this case, what's happening? We are missing out on this part. So it's not having a good accuracy, right? So let's do one thing. Let's try to divide this entire region into two parts, two equal parts, basically parts of having equal width. Okay. Now in that case, we are able to form two rectangles, right? In this case, we can find out this area. We can find out this area. We are missing out on this one and this one, but we can see that our accuracy has improved, right? Now let's say we are dividing this area into four parts of equal width, right? In that case, what's happening? We can see that we are able to find out these areas and we are missing out on these ones, smaller ones. Again, we can see that our accuracy has improved. So let's do one thing. Let's try to divide this area into very small, very thin strips, right? Very thin, infinitesimally thin strips. Okay. So let's say this is a very thin strip. Okay. And this length is dx, which is very small, very, very small, infinitesimally small. It is at a distance of x from here. Okay. X from origin. Okay. Now at this particular point, this function, Value would be f of x, right? And function value is nothing but this height only, right? So for this particular rectangle, area would be delta equals to fx into dx. dx is the width and fx is the length, right? Now, if we do the summation over here, summation fx dx, we'll be able to find out all these strips over here with basically area of all the strips and we are summing them up. So that would give us the entire area for this particular region, right? Now, when we apply limit over here, basically we are making dx so small that is that it is approaching zero. In that case, we can write this as integral a to b fx dx, right? So that is the significance of integral fx dx from a to b. Basically, it's the area under the curve. Okay. Now, one important thing over here. Whenever the curve is above x-axis, in that case, area would come out as positive. And whenever the curve is below x-axis, in that case, area would come out as negative. But mind that we are going from here to here. Okay. So in case we are going from left to right and function is above x-axis, in that case, area would come out as positive. And when we are going from here to here, basically from left to right, and the function is below x-axis, in that case, area would come out as negative, right? Don't forget this part. We are going from A to B. We are going from left to right. Okay. And now let's talk about basics of different integrals and changing of limits. Okay. So let fx be a continuous function. This is the most important keyword over here. Let fx be a continuous function defined on A to B, right? This should not be forgotten. It should be a continuous function. This should be a continuous function defined from A to B. Okay. So whenever this is happening, we can write this as FB minus FA. So that basically means if integral fx dx equals to capital fx plus c, right? In that case, integral a to b fx dx would be fb minus f of a. Okay. This you have to remember. But the most important thing over here is the function should be continuous between a to b, right? Only in that case, you'll be able to use this particular formula. Okay. And now what about changing of limits? Let's say we have integral zero to pi by two cos X ln sine X dx, right? Now we can see that we have a composite function over here and sine X is the argument. We have cos X dx, right? 
so that gives us the hint that we have to use sin x equals to t as a substitution right so if you differentiate this one we'll be getting cos x dx equals to dt right now this integral becomes this cos x dx is dt ln sin x is ln t dt okay now what about limits so when x equals to 0 this t would become 0 only because sin 0 is 0 only when x equals to pi by 2 sin pi by 2 is 1 so t equals to 1 so this is how you have to change your limits and now let's solve this example we have integral 3 to 8 sin of under root x plus 1 divided by under root x plus 1 dx right now we can see that this is a composite function and under root x plus 1 is the argument of this composite function right and we also have dx upon under root x plus 1 so considering everything the obvious substitution over here is under root x plus 1 equals to t right so if you differentiate this one you'll be getting 1 upon 2 under root x plus 1 into 1 dx equals to dt right so this gives us dx upon under root x plus 1 equals to 2 dt right simple now this integral becomes sine t and this becomes dt right now what about limits so when x equals to 3 this t becomes 2 when x equals to 8 this t becomes 3 right so this is the final integral now integral sine t would be minus cos t going from 2 to 3 right so this actually becomes minus times cos cos 3 minus cos 2 this should be our answer okay and now let's solve this example we have integral 0 to 1 x times ln of 1 plus 2 x dx so we can see that this is a log function and this is an algebraic function right so we have to use by parts because we cannot use any kind of substitution over here right so if we write down our i late one we can see that algebraic functions are coming after log functions right so basically log functions are tougher to integrate as compared to algebraic functions right so this function would be marked as first function and this is second function okay so this integral becomes first function into integral of second that is x square by 2 0 to 1 minus integral of derivative of 1 that is 1 upon 1 plus 2x multiplied by 2 into integral of second that is x square by 2 dx right so this two gets cancelled out now i can see that this is very standard no so if you do this one if you solve this one we'll be getting ln of 1 plus 2 into 1 dot 1 by 2 minus ln of 1 plus 2 into 0 multiplied by 0 by 2 so this is 0 only so ultimately what we have got we have got ln 3 by 2 so this portion is sorted right so this is nothing but ln 3 by 2 now if you talk about this one let's say this is i okay so what we can do we can multiply divide by 4 over here so we have got 1 upon 4 integral 4x square dx divided by 1 plus 2x why i did that because after this i'll be doing plus 1 and minus 1 and this portion 4x square minus 1 that would generate 1 plus 2x and 1 minus 2x in the numerator right so that would help us cancelling out this denominator okay so this actually becomes 1 by 4 integral 0 to 1 this is 2x plus 1 2x minus 1 basically clubbing 4x square minus 1 divided by 1 plus 2x dx plus 1 by 4 integral 0 to 1 dx upon 1 plus 2x basically remaining 1 1 upon 1 plus 2x right now this is again pretty standard this is nothing but 1 upon 2 ln of 1 plus 2x right you can again put down the limits in this case this and this gets cancelled out what we have got 1 upon 4 integral 0 to 1 2x minus 1 dx this is again pretty standard yeah you can calculate this one and this one right and this was ln 3 by 2 okay so this question was pretty calculative and similar kind of calculative question was there in pg debate 2023 right so that also involved by parts and that was just pure calculation no trick just pure calculation right so you have to you know be patient over there to solve these kind of questions and you'll get the answer okay now let's talk about properties of different integrals so the property one is integral a to b fx dx equals to integral a to b ft dt that's very simple no let's say we use the substitution as x equals to t so dx equals to dt what about the limits if x equals to a t equals to a if x equals to b t equals to b right so this integral becomes a to b ft dt very simple that's very simple too. you don't even need the proof for this one now let's talk about second property we have integral a to b fx dx equals to integral minus b to a fx dx right now what's happening over here let's say integral fx dx equals to capital fx plus c right 
In that case, what we can write? We can write integral f x dx a to b as f of b minus f of a. Basic property, no? Right. Now let's say we are talking about this one. In this case, what we are doing? Minus of integral b to a f of x dx. Right. This actually becomes minus times f of a minus f of b. Right. So this actually becomes f b minus f a. So this is same as this one, right? Hence proved. And now if we talk about property three, we have integral a to b f x dx equals to integral a to c f x dx plus integral c to b f x dx. So integral is broken at points of discontinuity or at points where function definition is changing, right? So what do we mean by that? So if you remember, we talked about a to b integral f x dx equals to capital F of b minus capital F of a, right? We talked about this. This is only true. This is only true when this function is defined between a to b and also continues between a and b, right? So this formula is only true when this function small fx is defined between a to b and also continuous between a and b, right? Now, let's try to demonstrate with the help of a graph, okay? So let's say we have a function which is discontinuous at a particular point. So this function looks like this, okay? Okay, so this function definition is x squared plus one from zero to one over here, and from one to infinity, the function is x cubed plus two. Okay, let's say we have defined a function like this, and we have a discontinuity at x equals to one. Okay, now what's happening over here when we're writing this formula integral a to b f x dx equals to capital F of b minus capital F of a. When we're writing this formula, we are saying that we have a unique integral for this entire function. Which is true, right? Because this function is continuous, so that's why we have a unique integral that is f x plus c for this entire integral, right? So that's why we are able to write this particular formula. But over here, when we have a discontinuity, basically we have created two functions. In short, what we have done is when we have a discontinuity, we have created two functions, right? We are defining them as one function. When we are defining okay f x equals two, we are defining them as one function based on piecewise function properties. But in reality, from here to here, from zero to one, it's a separate function. From one to infinity, it's a separate function. So it cannot have a single value, capital F x, satisfying this integral, right? So that's why we have to break down that function at the point of discontinuity. Now this function is continuous over here, and this function is continuous over here, and we can use this separate integral and separate integral. Okay? So that's how we have to do this. Okay? And now let's solve this example. We have integral zero to three g f x d x. Now we know that gi function is discontinuous at integers. So for zero to three, gi function would be defined as zero, one, and two. So for zero, range would be x less than one, bigger than equals to zero. For one, range would be x less than two, bigger than equals to one. And for this one, it would be x less than three, bigger than equals to two. Right? Now we have defined this function to three parts, basically three continuous parts. In this range, this is continuous. In this range, this is continuous. And in this range, this is continuous because it's a constant function. Okay? So we can break down this integral to three parts. The first part would be zero to one, and we have zero dx because function is zero over here. Right. Second portion would be one to two, and this would be one dx. Right. And third portion would be two to three, and we have two dx. Okay. So now you can solve this integral. It's very simple. Okay. And now let's solve this example. We have integral zero to pi under root one plus cos two x by two dx. Right. Now whenever you see one plus cos two x, the first thing that should trigger in your mind is two cos square x. Right. So this integral becomes zero to pi under root two cos square x by two dx. So this two and two gets cancelled out. What we have got under root cos square x that is nothing but mod cos x, right? So we have got zero to pi mod cos x dx. Now we know that mod cos x is changing its definition at pi by two. So we have mod cos x equals to cos x and minus cos x. This portion went. X is less than equals to pi by two and bigger than equals to zero, right? And this portion when when X is less than equals to pi and bigger than pi by two, okay? So we have break, uh, broken down this function into two parts. So basically, definition is changing for this particular function. So integral should change. So this would become zero to pi by two cos x dx minus integral pi by two to pi cos x dx. Now you have to calculate this integral. Very simple, okay? And now let's solve this example. We have integral minus pi by two to pi by two under root cos x minus cos cube x dx, right? 
Now this integral can be written as minus pi by two to pi by two integral under root. Let's take cos x is common. We've got one minus cos square x dx. Now one minus cos square x is nothing but sine square x. So this becomes sine square x, right? Now this can be written as minus pi by two to pi by two integral under root cos x multiplied by mod sine x dx. Why mod sine x? Because under root sine square x is mod sine x. Okay. Now we can see that the definition of this function is changing because of mod sine x. Sine x is negative from minus pi by two to zero, and sine x is positive from zero to pi by two. So that's why we have to break down this function into two parts because of change in definition. So you can keep that as homework. That same as last example. Okay. So today's lecture was still here only, and we'll talk about property four, five, and six in the next lecture. So let's meet in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.